This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now I am just so excited for today's show because I'll be interviewing my second Saturday Night Live legend. Two years ago I interviewed Ann Beats, God rest her soul, but today I will interview Tom Schiller. Yes, Schiller's real. A guy made all those classic European art film style shorts on Saturday Night Live in the 70s. You know, um, Don't Look Back in Anger, you know, where John Belushi is the, is, uh, the old version of himself and he's dancing on the graves of all the other not ready for time, prime time players. Uh, La Deutsche Gilda, the Java Junkie with um, Peter Aykroyd, who we recently lost. Uh, where he's just drinking one cup of coffee after another in a 40s film noir style. The Acid Generation, where they now, uh, the one where Bill Murray's uh, doing the Shakespeare lines. So many of them, you know. And he made a barely released film in the 80s called Nothing Lasts Forever. It was Zach Galligan. And uh, he was also a writer on Not Necessarily the News. And I'm going to ask him about all that stuff today. Uh, the guy is just a legend, and it's going to be a great honor. His wife, Jackie, set this up for us, and I want to thank her especially for that. And March Madness is starting to wind down. Um, it's been a great month so far, and it's going to continue being great as the next two weeks abound. So yeah, here is my interview with Tom Schiller. Hey, Tom, welcome to the show. How are you today, sir? Tommy Kovac? Yes, indeed. I, I'm proud to be a splat from the past. I feel like a splat. <laughs> how, how, what number splat am I? 5,482? 1,473. Oh, man, that's great. Yeah, yes. I'm destined further for obscurity. <laughs> this is uh, such a great honor, sir. Thank you for taking the time today. My pleasure, and call me Tom. Okay, Tom. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, g going back in time, uh, I know that uh, your father, Bob Schiller, was a writer for television. Uh, did he instill a love in comedy uh, with you? Did he? No. no. Um, yes, he um, didn't instill it. I sort of got it through osmosis. I mean... He was pretty funny uh, in real life, mm -hmm. and uh, when he wrote I Love Lucy, I mean, he would make observational funny stuff around in life, but he never really taught me anything, it, except you have to have a joke once every couple of lines <laughs> for a sitcom. Right. Like, what sitcoms did you uh, watch growing up? Pardon me? Which uh, sitcoms did you watch growing up? None. None? <laughs> no, I liked Walt Disney. In fact, I told the kids at school, mm -hmm. my fifth grade, that <clears throat> my father was Walt Disney. Uh, I didn't <laughs> think I Love Lucy was that cool. And once this kid was coming home from school with me, and my dad got off work early and drove in the driveway, and the kid said, hey, that isn't Walt Disney. And I said, well, when he goes on camera, they give him a mustache and everything. <laughs> <laughs> how long did he, that he believed me oh yeah how long did they believe you for <laughs> they didn't pursue it further I don't, I don't know <laughs> yeah back in those days you could get away with, with, with telling kids those lies but now there's the internet <laughs> yeah exactly I prefer it be pre-internet <laughs> did, did you did you at least spend any time on, on the set of uh, I Love Lucy or the Red Skelton Hour or any of those shows um, I, I was about 11 or 10 when I got to go with my dad to the I Love Lucy set, and mm -hmm. I loved it. I loved the sets. I liked the artificiality of the sets and everything. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I got to go to the show with him, and I saw Desi Arnaz do the warm-up, and then Lucy would come out, and Fred and Ethel. And <clears throat> during the show, I actually I saw the uh, grape-stomping sequence when I was little oh. and went down to the set and looked in that vat and it was real grapes but during the show I used to go in the sound booth with the sound
sound technician during the show and watch him, you know, mix the show and the VU needles and stuff. And I, I and then once uh, Milton Burl took me into the editing room and showed me this four-headed moviola, which they showed all the four angles of the show, mm -hmm. and he explained how they cut it together. So I had good teachers. Amazing. Do, do, you, do you remember the first movie you ever saw that made you want to be a filmmaker? The Red Balloon. This is the French short film with the little boy that gets that red balloon and goes around Paris with it as his friend. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to either make a film or be that little boy. Wow. I know that uh, Fellini had a huge influence on you, but were there any other filmmakers uh, you enjoyed? Ingmar Bergman was top. Um, mm -hmm. Jacques Tati, Mon Oncle, was very good. He, he was great. Mm -hmm. I liked practically every 40s black and white American film. Preston Sturges was one of my favorites. And uh, I guess also Jean-Luc Godard and those kind of guys. Oh, yeah. Those guys are great. Yeah. I wanted to be a French foreign film director. <laughs> so at what point did you uh, meet Henry Miller? I was working for several years with a, as an apprentice to this guy named Robert Snyder, mm -hmm. who's a documentary filmmaker, and we made film. I learned camera, sound, and editing from the people he would make films about, like uh, Willem de Kooning, the artist, Anais Nin, the writer, Buckminster Fuller, the architect of the geodesic dome, and <clears throat> he got an assignment from the BBC to film Henry Miller. So he was living there in the Palisades where I grew up, and we went over to his house and filmed him, and I, just, I was the sound man, and I talked to him afterwards. He was just wonderful. He was so warm and told these stories and everything, and after talking to him, he said, you know, Tom, you remind me of myself when I was younger. You come over, visit me, wake me up if you have to. And I did for the next nine years. I was his pal. Did, did he teach? Oh, and wait, and then I no. made my own film on him, which you can still get now, which I think is my best work, called Henry Miller, Asleep and Awake. Yeah, I saw that on YouTube the other day. Mm -hmm. I liked it. Yeah. It was pretty interesting. Did, did he teach you stuff that you still uh, use to this day? Yes, he had, he had this one, uh, kind of a Zen philosophy, Henry Miller philosophy, which was, for example, do what's right under your nose to do. Don't worry about side things or anything else to do. Just do the stuff that's right, presents itself right now. And that was good advice. I follow that. A lot of stuff he taught me was good. Yeah, his his book *Tropic of Cancer* that was probably the first erotica book that the world saw. That's right. It was smuggled by the GIs after World War II. Oh yeah. <laughs> it was banned in the United States. Yeah, but they brought it in from France. Wow. So your your dad is writing for a show. He meets Lorne Michaels, who's in the writing staff as well, and then he connects you two. That's right. He. He used to come down to some beach house that my dad had and I'd play Scrabble with him. Mm -hmm. My dad, I, I was living in Copenhagen. I came back and he said, you've got to meet this guy, Lorne Michaels. He, he knows every good restaurant in Los Angeles. And I thought that was a weird, I don't care really that much about restaurants in Los Angeles. But I did <laughs> meet him finally. He came over to the house with his friend, uh, John Head, a good guy. Mm -hmm. And there's Lorne. He had a sort of a Hawaiian shirt on, and he seemed nice. And we took a sort of historic walk into the mountains with everybody. And he told me stuff like, you should be working with your peers, and uh, you, I'm starting this new show in New York, and I think you would be good for it, and blah, blah, blah. And I was dubious, but lit a doobie. I got <laughs> less dubious. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> And so did he, did he tell you then that um, he wanted to do a, a show like Saturday Night Live? Well, it wasn't exactly then, I don't think. Later, when I became pals with him and hung out with him at, at the Chateau Marmont, mm -hmm. met all sorts of colorful people who would later be 
part of the show, then he would stop. He would talk about this new show he wanted to start, and he would talk, and he would talk, and he would talk. It was a, an obsession with him, and it was kind of charismatic and captivating, and he really <clears throat> painted a picture of a, this New York show on live television, and it, it sounded interesting. So he kind of won me over, mm -hmm. invited me there. But Henry Miller said, don't go. He said, television is bad for you. <laughs> Maybe he's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because at first you didn't want to do it, right? No, no, I was just some sort of a conceited film director in the making. <laughs> so I, I would never deign to go on make comedy on television. But later it worked out. Yeah, are you, are you still in shock that the show has become as iconic as it is and it's still going? I refuse to believe it. No, I, I, I am a little in shock. I, I still, it's like a staple of American television. I can't believe it that I was one of the few tiny people that started this thing from scratch and it's still going strong. It is amazing. I am in shock. Yeah, you probably thought back then, God, the this, this show's going to get canceled any day now because of the kind of jokes we do. <laughs> That's right. And also, you know, you didn't know from year to year if you'd get renewed in those early days. But then it just started going and going. Right. What, what, what was Michael O'Donohue like? He was interesting. He was like, I had heard of him from the National Lampoon magazine. Mm -hmm. He invented this character named Phoebe Zeitgeist, mm -hmm. and he, he was interesting, and he uh, had these round, dark glasses. You couldn't tell what he was thinking, but he was very terse, and, and he could fly off the handle uh, and get angry, and he smoked this, this, these long, more cigarettes. You know what that is? It's a brown oh, yeah. woman's length <laughs> cigarette or whatever it's called. Yeah. And I did see him get angry once when they did something. They didn't show one of his sketches or something. He threw an ashtray in his office, a glass one, mm -hmm. ricocheted 20 times without hitting anybody. <laughs> uh, nowadays, he'd probably get sued for that. Yeah, no, right. Yeah, he, he was no doubt a brilliant master of black comedy. I don't know if he realized that or not, but he certainly had a gift for it. Yes, he did. I think he kind of knew it. Yeah, I just think that guy could have done so much more than he did, you know. And there's only a certain amount of work that he did. And of course, right. And of course, yeah, him and Ann Beats, you know, they both came from um, National Lampoon, and uh, Ann could do black comedy as well. And uh, what was she like to work with? She was engaging and fun, and had these big light -like, uh, wrist, uh, these uh, what should I call it, things on your wrist that clattered around as she talked. She was animated and funny and brilliant and a nice, nice person. Yeah, when I interviewed her two years ago, my impression of her was that she was a, a sweetheart but also tough as nails. Yeah, she could get her way. And remember that women didn't have as much power or they were seeking it then more or something. I don't know. She yeah. had to fight more, especially as a com comedian writer, a comic writer woman. Do, do you know if she was the first woman of the, of the three to be hired of, um, in terms of writing? I don't know. Yeah, I always, I always thought that she was the first writer, period, on that show. But then, of course, Marilyn Miller and Rosie Schuster were on there as well. I think Rosie was hired by dint of that she was being divorced from Lauren. And the Marilyn Miller came in later, so I think Anne would have been the second writer. Mm-hmm. What, what do you remember about Andy Kaufman coming on the show? Uh, he was a curious character. I had seen him around in the New York comedy clubs mm -hmm. doing that M Mighty Mouse routine, which I thought was hilarious. But when you meet, if you met him, he was kind of impassive. You couldn't get past his look, his gaze at you. Mm -hmm. he, he kind of answered in a strange way. I don't know. Um, he wasn't warm and fuzzy, if you want to, if you mean, you know, that way. And then once I, I noticed that on his uh, dressing room before the show, when he was appearing on the show, <clears throat> he put a piece of paper that said meditating. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you couldn't go in. But um, I, I loved him. 
Yeah. He he was probably one of those guys who loved to be in character because if he wasn't in character, he wasn't about to like open up to anybody. Exactly. Wonderful. You're right. Yeah, that guy. He was a one of a kind. <laughs> yes, he was. When um, Desi Arnaz hosted in 1976, you did the sketch "I Love Desi." What did he? What did Desi himself think of your impression of him? He didn't say. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think. I mean, he had written a book called "A Book," and I had him sign it. He said, "I." He signed it. You know, I loved your father. Now I love you too. <laughs> signed Desi. But I appeared with Desi Arnaz Jr., who was a sort of a pal, and that I knew him from when I was 10, mm-hmm. the set of I Love Lucy. But they didn't say much about my imitation. It was probably better than the real Desi. No, just kidding. <laughs> I think you did a pretty good one, you know. Uh, you did, again, uh, in the, the the sketch where Rick Nelson is in the Twilight Zone. He goes from Her- Ozzy and Harriet to Leave it to Beaver to I Love Lucy. That's right. That was fun. It was, it was more, in those days, like something in black and white was rather novel. And that, now it's been used so many times, it's just lost novelty. Yeah, that's, that sketch was a love letter to the baby boomers. <laughs> that's correct. I don't think nobody even knows about it now or cares. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do. <laughs> well, that's good, Tommy, or else I wouldn't be on the phone with you. <laughs> Were you always uh, comfortable performing, or did that take some getting used to? No, I was terrified. But I liked being an extra, which I was a lot in a lot of st- stuff, because you could be kind of in the background and you didn't have lines or anything. But let's say I had a couple of lines. Mm-hmm. I would be terrified. I would practice the lines like 2,000 times before I got on camera, and then when I was on camera, I would foul them up usually. So sometimes I would paste the lines in the back of the set on the wall. And once Gilda was in a sketch and she saw that and she said, Schiller's here. <laughs> yeah, because you, you, um, uh, you were like a, re- a semi-regular by the last season that the Not Ready for Primetime players were on there. Yeah, that was by default because everyone else had gone off to movies or something. And they had slim pickings with the writers who were left and used them as, as actors. Yeah, Martin Short said in an interview recently he was offered by Lauren to uh, join the cast that season, but he was already committed to a series out in L.A. Yeah, that sounds right. So there, there was a sketch that you guys did that I, I cannot believe it was pulled off. It was called Attack of the Atomic Lobsters. Do you remember that? Yeah, I thought it went. I thought it was like at the end of the show, yeah. the whole show was destroyed by the lobsters at the end. Yeah, I mean... Uh, uh, I, that was O'Donohue. Yeah, I mean, you, you guys re- really pulled it off well to make it look like a national panic was happening in the NBC building. Was, was the whole building in on the joke? No. It was just... <laughs> no, it was just staged there for the cameras. I don't know what you mean. Like, like, did everyone have to know that this was that this joke was going to happen? That you know, everyone was going to have to act like you know they were being invaded by lobsters in a panic. Oh, sure, yeah, or else you couldn't pull it off. Yeah, I think you know, in today's world with the, with the internet and everyone being sensitive, I don't, I don't think you know, it would go unless you know you have to give some kind of a disclaimer at the beginning of it. Yes, you said it. You said it exactly right. It's different times now. And it's more sensitive and dangerous than you, they would think it was a terrorist attack or something, or a grid going out or something. That's a perfect way of putting it, a terrorist attack. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So who who are your favorite SNL hosts that you remember that were good to work with? Well, um, of course, I loved all of the hundreds and hundreds of popular hosts that came through the show, and I was lucky enough to meet them and work with them and stuff. <clears throat> but my favorites were really the the old timers who really nobody probably remembers today, like Roderick Crawford. Yep. Uh, you know who that is? Uh, Highway Patrol. Yes, exactly. Yep. He was he came on the show and he was like ninety, <laughs> <laughs> and he was like 
everyone loved him of uh, his generation, and he sat in my office for some time. I don't know why he chose my office and talked to me about the old days. And he said, finally, life is fun, and I really like that. Then I also liked Desi Arnaz, of course, because I knew him from when I was little. But <clears throat> somebody said, John Head said, old blue lips is back. <laughs> <laughs> lips were kind of getting blue. And I liked Milton Berle. Yeah. I knew him when I was little, and he was the only host who successfully rested, uh, wrestled the show away from Lorne. And he turned it into this really corny um, late night show with piano music and stuff. I don't know yep. how he did that, but it, the show was never shown again. He was horrible. He told off color jokes. And, and finally, I like Tony Perkins, you know, Psycho, that yep. guy. He, um, I was an extra on some uh, uh, square dance sequence or something. Mm -hmm. And as we were li waiting to go on the air, like five minutes to go on the air, and the cameras were configuring, and I was standing kind of next to him, he turned to me and said, I dropped mescaline. <laughs> 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 I thought that was rather ballsy. Yeah. L Lorraine has said that uh, she was instrumental in getting Christopher Lee for the show, but he didn't want to play Dracula. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Some some hosts had, uh, they were kind of testy about doing certain things. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, uh, Anne told me, you know, um, Louise Lasser, she thought was the most difficult uh, uh, host, and that in general, the female uh, hosts were usually the most difficult. Yeah, probably. I remember Louise Lasser. Yeah, she was not on time, and she didn't show up or something weird that was bad. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you guys got had legends there. Jack Burns was there, Kirk Douglas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, Kirk Douglas, there was a bar mitzvah dinner, and I was some actor in it. I was uh, the father. Right. He told me, I, hey, you're funny. If you have any scripts, send them to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was uh, flattered, and also... Um, yeah, when, when an actor tells you that, it's pretty good. Yeah. So the first film you uh, did for SNL was uh, The Acid Generation, Where Are They Now? Uh, where did that come from? Well, I'm always fascinated with the idea is that we're all going to get old. Yeah. And like these young, beautiful people are going to turn into really old people. Yeah. And all the hippies who were, who I was in that generation that were so free in all of that business, you know, I, can't, I always have pictured them as being old. Like, what are they going to look like? Mm -hmm. So we filmed all these uh, senior citizens at a senior citizen center in Venice, California, saying things like, I remember Hendrix as Monterey as if it was yesterday. Wow, so you were, you were at uh, Monterey? I actually did go to Monterey. I, it was a Instead of my high school graduation, I drove up to Monterey in my Volkswagen alone, and this sprawling field was empty with a stage. And I asked the guy, his name was Chip Monk, who organized it, and he, I said, could I sleep overnight right. in the car? And I, he said, yeah. So I slept overnight, and I woke up, and there were 10,000 hippies smoking pot and with incense and walking around, <laughs> and Jimi Hendrix throwing his burning guitar into the crowd. Wow. God, that must have been just amazing. It's like um, uh, years ago now, and it is. <laughs> yeah, it seems like only yesterday, huh? <laughs> right. <laughs> the, the two that you're known for the most are Don't Look Back in Anger and La Deutsche Gilda. Um, I think both of these films are a gift from God because... Uh, I mean, it's ironic enough that John and Gilda were the first two to pass away, but no one captured their talents on film the way you did, and I sincerely mean that, Tom. Wow, thanks a lot. I'm, I'm beaming. Do, 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 do people ever tell you that, though? Well, I've been told over the years that those are interesting, and also I tell people, don't let me film you or you're going to die. <laughs> well, Bill Murray's still alive and you filmed him. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell me the genesis of Don't Look Back in Anger. Um, 
again, it was like the acid generation. I realized that we we're all going to get old. Mm -hmm. And I felt that Belushi was the like mascot of Saturday Night Live. When you think of Saturday Night Live, he's like the main guy that sprung out at you. Yeah. You no, know, he symbolized that. And I thought, well, what if he lived and everyone else died? And we took it from there. Yeah, how was uh, actually filming the, um, that film? It was, I, we picked him up in a van that morning, and he had been out drinking the night before. <laughs> and he, the van had a little bed in the back, and he, I was amazed that he could sleep soundly on the highway as we were <laughs> driving to the cemetery. Yeah. Uh, he could, you know, he's that type of person. He could fall asleep anywhere. Anyway, at the shooting it, he, he was fine. He went to every gravestone perfectly without blocking it. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he was perfect. I can't say anything else. And I, I'm sure the way he looked, you know, before the makeup was on didn't make any difference because it fit well for the, you know, the old character he's playing there. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, so it just took a day to film that? Yeah, one afternoon. Oh, you, I think we took another shot of him in a train going out there. Yes. Today, but that's all. Oh, yeah, when, uh, when he first gets there, he's on the train. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, La Dolce Gilda, uh, how was filming that one? Well, La Dolce Gilda was... Um, of all the people on the show, I felt that Gilda was the heart of the show. Do you yes. know what I mean? Yes. It reminded me, in a way, of Giulietta Massina, who was Fellini's wife. Knights of Cabiria and stuff like La Strada, that woman. Mm -hmm. And Gilda could have that s sadness and sensitivity quality that, that was so poignant. So I decided to put her in a Fellini movie. And we stayed, we went to our after party of the show at this place called One Fifth Avenue downtown. And <clears throat> I got everyone to act in it, including um, some uh, notable uh, Greenwich Village poet people types. Mm -hmm. And then I, we went out to the West Side Highway, which was still standing for the last shot, you know. And I, we had to wait until dawn come, came up for her to film that part after, all night. We, we waited all night, and then we filmed the last part where she looks at the camera and then a balloon flies into the sky. But then I realized later in life that I could have shot that any time. I didn't have to stay up all night. It right. It's daylight. I thought I was a real idiot, but it did add to the reality of the tiredness and, the, I don't know, the sense of the poignancy of the whole thing. Oh, and then I showed it to Fellini. Mm-hmm. I took on a trip to Rome. I went, sought him out, and screened it, and he liked it. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. good. My, he was my great hero. Yeah, so did you spend a lot of time with him? No, not that much. It's a couple of times visiting him at the studio, Chinichita. Yeah, I just, I tear up every time I see that last shot with Gilda talking to the camera, and then the mime has that balloon. It's just, it's beautiful, Tom. It really is. Why, thank you again. I'm beaming. I'm delighted you liked it. <laughs> and, of course, we just lost um, Peter Aykroyd. You did the Java Junkie with him. I can relate to that one because I, I drink a lot of coffee. Um, it's kind of a 40s noir homage. Uh, was it intended to be? Oh, absolutely. It's meant to be. I think Peter Ackroyd was an underestimated great actor, and yeah. I think he, he, it's too bad he died. I think he could have done a lot more oh. stuff and feature films and stuff like that, but he was a good guy, really interesting. And an Ackroyd, which means you're a little weird, which is, but good weird. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he actually recorded some songs uh, for a, a couple of Dan's movies that he was into music. Mm hmm that's right. Yeah, I love. Yeah, that's a that's a really funny film. When so when you made um, nothing lasts forever, how, how did you find Zach Galligan? I well, I auditioned a whole bunch of people, and um, including known people whose names escape me at the moment, and I didn't want a known person. Mm -hmm. And he he sort of had that look. He was eighteen, and he was like the um, 
an Upper East Side kid, you know, who went to a prep school or something, looked like that. So yeah. he, to me, he was perfect. And also, he hadn't been in anything. He, Gremlins came afterwards. Right. I've met him at a few horror cons. He's a very interesting and deep guy. Yes, he is. Yeah, first time I met him, I told him, you know, how uh, Gremlin scared me a little bit when I was a kid. And then he went on this five-minute tirade about how our, our first, our earliest memories are, are about stuff that we're afraid of. And I'm just listening to him, and I don't have anything to add because he's a very smart guy. And my only response was, can I get a picture with you, Mr. Galligan? <laughs> <laughs> no, he was perfect. Yeah. So how did you go about casting Mort Saul and Imogen Coca? They're legends. Well, first of all, I used to go with my dad to visit Mort Saul in Hollywood when I was like 10. Mm -hmm. I knew him already. And he, I liked him because he had mad magazines around the house. <laughs> While he and my father were talking, I would look at the mad magazines. And also another magazine called Humbug. I don't think you've ever heard of that one. but No. <laughs> it, it's good. And, and anyway, that, that was Sam Jaffe, and I, I don't mean Sam Jaffe, I mean Mort Saul. Right. And I just called him up and asked him, and he did it. And, uh, wait, who did you also, uh, Imogene Coca? Imogene Coca, yeah. Well, one of the advantages of having a father who wrote for television was that when I was about seven, um, and I'd gone to sleep, they would, my mother and father would come and wake me up if they were doing a good sketch on your show of shows with Emma Jean Coca was on it and Sid Caesar. So I remember seeing her when I was seven and thinking she was so funny. I love her. Oh, yeah. I think um, the, the closest we have to an Emma Jean Coca now is Rachel Dratch. Yes, I would say so. I agree with you. Yeah, she's just got that, that animated face, you know. <laughs> yeah, and she's, she's so funny. I, I love Rachel Dratch. Yeah, I, li I like her. She's she's awesome. I, I know you've uh, talked about this a million times, but w why didn't the movie get a huge release? Well, it was one word, mm -hmm. mad. <laughs> 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 no, I really, you know, to this day, I don't have a concrete explanation as to why it was never released. My thing was that I just think... It wasn't commercial that they were expecting a sort of Saturday Night Live Animal House or something yeah. movie, and it, it, it had that. They say things about stock footage wasn't cleared or the music wasn't cleared, but those are all things that should be done before a film is released, you know? Yeah. So I don't buy that. I think it just wasn't commercial. Yeah, uh, Leonard Malton gave it a good review in his movie guide. Oh, yeah, right, and... I got a fantastic review in uh, The New Yorker uh, by a guy named Richard Brody, who's the film reviewer for The New Yorker, saying it was a masterpiece. And you know they wanted it two times in a row at Cannes. Nice, nice. That was before Sundance. You probably could have uh, done good there, too. Yeah, probably. How was writing for Not Necessarily the News? Well... In a way, I had been for Weekend Update. It was the same thing, except they, no other show around it. It was just news or TV jokes and things like that. So I don't know. I, I, it was too much of a one-note samba, although I really liked those guys. I thought they were really funny, and I loved doing it. But it was in L.A. It wasn't in, in New York. It was, didn't have the edge that, that Saturday night had. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> I got some deal to write a script, so I didn't work there too long. You, you would think it would be edgier because it was on HBO. Yeah, you would? I don't know. Is it? Is HBO edgier? Oh, yeah, you can do more of uh, what you want, right? Right. You could swear, you could have nudity on there, all of that. Well, nothing seems edgier now. Yeah, well, nowadays, but back then, you know, you would get away with a lot. Yeah. Were, were you there the same time as Conan? Yes, I was, his office was down the hall from me, and we were pals, I mean, friends, we worked together, he was a good guy, I liked him. Yeah, now, you, you probably at the time didn't think he was going to be a successful talk show host. No, I had no idea, 
it, it's really strange. In the same way that Bob Odekirk, I never thought he would become a masterful television actor. Yeah, <laughs> he's he's a very funny guy, Od yeah. Odenkirk. So, do do you have any upcoming projects you'd like to mention? Um, just getting through this call. <laughs> you don't have like you know any any films that you're making or anything. Well, um, I I appear in some short films that people are doing. A guy named Eric Johnson did a film called Observatory Blues. I was in, another guy, Connor Dooley, made a film that I'm in and going to be in. Mm -hmm. So I kind of do that. But my main occupation is the relief of not forcing creativity. It's such a pleasure. I mean, I, I think I had a good opus. And right now, I just, I like wandering around aimlessly in my pajamas. <laughs> oh, we all like to do that, of course. <laughs> How's, how's the COVID situation been for you over there? Well, thank God nothing happened. I mean, we seem to have lost it, but my adorable wife, Jackie, is very cautious, and we don't, we don't mingle with people who have <clears throat> sores on their faces or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, we've been very lucky, actually, and we're in a... In a more of a rural setting, so we're not in, plunged into a lot of people or anything. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Well, Tom, I can't tell you what a tremendous honor this has been. I want to thank, not only thank you for your time, but also thank uh, Jackie, your wife, for setting this up. My pleasure. My God, it's a pleasure. And I can't wait to see it on your website. On my YouTube channel. Yes, it'll be, uh, it'll be there, you know, uh, by later today. I'll be sitting near my computer waiting, but it's pl Tommy, it's a pleasure. You're doing the good work. Thank you're, you, sir. You're splatting the future. <laughs> uh, I hope I'm doing something right. Well, you are. thank you so much, sir. That means a lot coming from you. You have yourself a great day, and please be safe. You too, and good luck to you. Thanks for calling. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Tom Schiller. Ain't he a cool dude? Oh my god. Funny, sarcastic, great stories. I mean, I just enjoyed that, you know, talking about the old Saturday Night Live days in such a short amount of time, too. I was able to get it done. I'm so proud of myself. So, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Later, dudes.